All right. Well, hi, everybody. Um, happy Wednesday. Uh, my name is Valerie Sloan. I work at the National Center for Atmospheric Research. Uh, my background is in Arctic and Alpine glacier history, and I work um, in more like um, career development now at higher education, supporting people and preparing for grad school and for jobs and that kind of thing. And um, my co-presenter is Rose, who I'll let you introduce yourself. Hi, everyone. My name is Rose Santana. Um, I'm a graduate student at the University of South Florida in St. Petersburg, and um, I study biological oceanography. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, thanks. And Rose, she um, has worked with me on this for well, last year and this year. And she is an awesome YouTuber and um, video maker and things like that with uh, Black and Marine Sciences BIMS. Um, okay, so before we go to the next slide, I just wanted to say two things. One is welcome, and I hope that it's going well. I know this is an intense kind of program to do, and so you can give yourselves a pat on the back for you know getting this far and working so hard. So congratulations, and give yourself some credit for that. Um, Okay, and then um, what we're going to just do first, we're going to talk about abstracts and then about slides in particular. Uh, but before that, I want to do a little bit of just introducing where I live. Um, so, Rose, if you could go to the next slide. So, Boulder is in Colorado. And just, just real quick, also, if you guys could let us know if this is your first RU or if you've done an RU before, that'd be great. If you could let us know in the chat. Cool. Mm -hmm. So this is a picture of the Boulder area on the right. And on the left is the place where I'm actually right now. It's an NCAR lab called National Center for Atmospheric Research. Um, and so, you know, it, it, people come here, it's beautiful. We have trails, you know, it's pretty sunny, um, this kind of thing. Um, but it's also got this sort of dark history that that people don't talk about, but it's coming, sort of coming out of it. Um, so click on the slide again, please. So first of all, people, you know, you'll see this, this is for real. I got these off the web yesterday. It's like Boulder, Colorado is the number one best place to live. Is it a good place to go to college? Yes, it is. It's the happiest city in America. And it's like, well, yeah, it's also rich and it's really expensive. It's not the best college town in America if you don't have a lot of money. So um, it's definitely a sort of privileged kind of place. Um, next slide, please. So part of the history of this land um, is that around 1850, just a quick history here, uh, silver and gold were discovered in the area and uh, European settlers came into the Boulder area and moved uh, the people from the Arapaho, Cheyenne, and Ute nations who were living in this, this region uh, moved them away so that the, set, the settlers could build on the land right next to the canyon of Boulder Canyon. That map on the left shows uh, all the different uh, tribes and nations in North America, and it's really staggering how many there are, and there's overlap as well. Um, so I just want to first of all acknowledge that this land that I live on and work on was the land of people who, you know, di didn't give it up willingly. Um, and the next slide shows, uh, I mean, the next click will show a picture of, if you can click on it. Um, so this shows sort of a hundred years ago in Boulder and um, black people initially were not allowed to live in Boulder. Like when they started settling Boulder, the Europeans, um, they had they made um, lots cost a hundred uh, sorry a thousand dollars each, and um, black people were not allowed to live in Boulder, and they were also not allowed to have very good jobs. Not and so um, when things happen like a big flood, then that impacted them more than others. Um, and so, uh, click again, please, and again. So there's this film I just want to recommend. It's on PBS, um, public broadcasting station, and it's it's recent and it's a one hour or less documentary about Boulder and the history and how 
people per here perceive it as this cool non-racist place, but the history is just writ with, with racism. And um, it's, it's a really good documentary. So just wanna, and also, you know, check out, also you can check out for where you live or study, look up things about like, what's the history and what's the, what, how, what are the racist events and issues that have come up? And it's kind of astonishing what you learn. Um, okay, so on to the abstract. So um, can you click again, please, Rose? Thanks for all of your, your puts in the chat. Um, it looks like for so many people. Okay, so um, if you could go back one click, please. So what, so in the chat, or if you want to unmic, um, just explain to us all, like what you think that an abstract of, it could be if, of or in a scientific paper does or is and what, yeah, what purpose it serves, but mostly what it is, how would you describe it? It should be a summary of the research, giving like very, not not in-depth as much because you want to save that for your, your, the body of your research mostly, but um, I should give a, a brief summary of what, just what your uh, research entails. Yes, right, it's a, it's a short summary. And in the chat we have, thank you um, for speaking up. Um, yeah, it's a summary, it explains, you know, it's really succinct, it's super succinct. So it can be basically like eight sentences long, for example. Um, yeah, so I definitely feel like that it should be like a hook to kind of just touch base on what you're doing and kind of get someone interested in wanting to uh, read more and learn more about your project. So you don't want to like over explain, you want to leave some room for your talk, but you want to yeah, right, right. Where you're going to be able to be interested. Exactly. It's the it's, it's really the only thing that mostly gets read by by the vast majority of people. Um, so partly because some apps, some papers are not all that accessible, but also it's like if people figure out, do I want to read it? And as um, Ethan says, make it compelling, like have a hook. Um, it's like something that makes you want to find out what more about it. Um, so it it really it really is an it has an important place. I think often we just think about like people at universities, professors, and so on. It's just like, oh yeah, you got to write your abstract and your title and submit it for, let's say, for a conference. But it's actually super important if your if your title is is really engaging versus not it's like people will actually <laughs> come and hear your talk or see your poster um click on the next one rose yeah so we've you've, you've covered it um ethan do you want to add anything about um what could make it compelling yeah of course i can try is, is my audio coming through it is okay um I mean, I'm no, I'm no expert on this. I just worked on my first abstract um, and I just did my first uh, scientific proposal. So I'm very, very new at all this, but um, I kind of just wanted to input that I think everyone can kind of agree that like when you're doing like literature review or like looking through scientific papers that, I mean, we're all skimming. Like we, we have to skim. There's so much stuff out there. Having an important title and like, a, a quickly compelling abstract is pretty much the only thing that will draw me into reading someone's papers. And mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. I feel like it's got to be one of the most important steps. Yeah, that makes I, sense. I, yeah, I don't have soup like any great pointers. I'm actually still having my first one reviewed, and I'm super excited to hear about it. But <laughs> yeah, well, I, I, I just you know, I know from from my perspective, like what like being a person that consumes them, it feels really really important. You know. Yeah. Right. I, I mean, it's it's true. It really is. Um, and then, um, as Chris wrote, it's a summary or synopsis of what the paper discusses. So it's super succinct. So let's go to the next slide. So this is uh, kind of the formula for an abstract. First, you kind of give some of the general background of situation of, of the, roughly, you know, the topic that you're looking at. Um, and then Next, you go into a little some more detail about something specific, more specific, 
and something it's sort of like a question that's there so it could be like we know that um that in brazil that the uh that the incidence of rabies in cities looks like it's maybe closer to for, for cities proximity to the jungle uh, from squirrels and but we don't really know if that's true um, and so then in this study we test or we identify or we investigate or show x y and z we look at we look at the data from the rabies occurrences in Brazil and their distances from the jungles where the squirrels are, where they primarily get the rabies. Um, and then the, the um, you basically hardly say anything about how. I mean, you can sort of say, well, we, we measured this and that, but it doesn't really, it's not a lot. Um, and then results um, with some concrete values, ideally, and what this could imply. Now, that's not to say everybody does this at all. Like you'll read loads of abstracts where people don't actually give the results. And at conferences, that's very common because we're writing them so far ahead of the conference that that's what happens. Um, next slide, please. So here's, I'd just like you to take a look at this one. It's, it's a little mind or your eyes probably blur over looking at it, but um, you can sort of see the, the, the pattern that was itemized in the last slide. First, the general background, and then specific background. Uh, what's the question? What, what's, what's the gap in the knowledge? And then, you know, here we report. Uh, the white is the paragraph of data, uh, the value is the concrete evidence. And then um, the pink at the bottom is sort of like the meaning of the results. Th this kind of uh, outline, by the way, applies to, in science, in the physical sciences, it applies to most types of communication, except for when you're getting into social media or journalism and that kind of thing. But in science, talks and papers and posters, you generally follow this kind of, uh, of order. Um, so, um, Rose, did you want to add, just add anything if you, if you care to, um, otherwise you can go to the next slide. Yeah, I mean, and also keep in mind that it comes with time, <laughs> you know, it's, you get a feel for it, your own writing style and, and how you like to do things, you know, you, you sort of get into a flow as you progress within your career. So don't like freak out if like your first abstract isn't good. My first abstract was absolute garbage <laughs> and it was just a learning thing. It was learning what works for me, what works, like what is mostly expected and just kind of making it your own. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good point. Okay, next slide. So here's another example. Um, so in recent years, high profile fatalities involving school aged pedestrians crossing the street at designated crosswalks have elevated the issue of pedestrian safety, especially, excuse me, with respect to highly vulnerable pedestrians like children. Um, while Section 136, one of the Highway Traffic Act clearly outlines the requirement to stop at posted stop signs, little is known about the average driver's propensity or tendency to comply with this law. So they've set the broader context in green, a more specific context in blue, and the question more or less in purple. Next is this study gained insight into this question by observing motorists as they approached a suburban stop sign and then coding their behavior. That just means like recording it so into one of three categories, full stop, rolling stop, and slow and go. And I don't know about you, but I'm guilty of the rolling stop. Stop and a slow and go. Okay, now in red, the study's findings suggest that the majority of drivers do not comply with the requirement to stop at stop signs, with more than one in four drivers almost completely disregarding the stop sign. Well, that's worrying. These findings suggest a need to solicit greater compliance rates among Ontario, that's in Canada, <laughs> where, I, where I'm from, drivers with respect to Section 136 of the Highway Traffic Act. So that, that, this is kind of a nice clean example where you've got the, those pieces are really clear. 
Okay, so let's go to an example where I want your help analyzing it. So next slide, please. So this is this is a long one, and <clears throat> um, it's it's in the area of like geomorphology and sediments and lakes and that kind of thing. So take a look at it and see if you can identify the different the, the first section, the, the broader context. <clears throat> And then if you think that the, if you can find the next one, which is the more specific context with the question. A lot of, most abstracts are longer like this. Medical abstracts are actually really pretty good. You know, they follow it really well. So what do you think? The general where, rule of thumb, Val, is it like usually 250 words for abstracts? I think it's about 150 to two, but sometimes 300. Yeah, good point. So can you offer up what might be the, the you know, the context setting sentence or sentences? Where would you, where would you draw a line between that and say more specific um, information? or question. And you can either put in the chat or you can unmute. It's not as clear cut, is it, as the last one? Okay. There we go. First two sentences. <clears throat> oh, there we go. Okay. Thank you for chiming in. So yes, everything before Glacier National Park is very is background. The first two sentences. Yeah, so also before Glacier National, the first Glacier National Park. Um, general Alpine basins versus Glacier National Park specifically. Yes. After that, it gets more specific. Yes, I agree. Okay, so then we go to the sentence, Glacier National Park, Montana, has experienced dramatic geomorphic and environmental change since the end of the peak of the last continental glaciation, which is about 20,000 years ago when almost all of Canada was covered by a, a giant ice sheet and part of the northern parts of the US, um, as well as documented change prior to the founding of the park in 1910. So as you, somebody pointed out, this is more detailed. Um, okay, so now in the next sentence, to better understand sediment transport and records of environmental change in Glacier National Park from the late Holocene, which is recent in the geological, to the present, we collected sediment cores from the floor of Fisher Cap Lake and Swift Current Valley. Um, I would argue that there are two sort of types of information in that sentence. What, what would you say if you were to split it into two, what would the first half prior to the comma be and the second half, more or less? It's not super clearly, um, identifiable, but I'm just wondering if you can see that. To better understand sediment transport, blah, 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 comma, we collected sediment cores. Right, okay, uh-huh, yes. And yes, exactly, so the knowledge gap. So but to, to better understand the sediment transport and records, so in other words, we don't know very much about it. This is a sort of an interesting thing that could provide us with good information. Um, they haven't really explained why this is important, but uh, we'll trust them for the moment. Um, it's basically part of understanding climate history. And then as you say, the, the uh, methods, um, we collected sediment cores from blah, blah, blah. So yes, and you could, you could sort of say that the, the first half is sort of like the question, right, as well. Um, yes, yeah, so somebody who did write that, Matthew, thank you. Cool, okay, so good. Now, in addition, we used ground penetrating radar 
to explore subsurface sedimentary structures of Fisher Cap Lake, um, which is only one meter deep. Um, approximately, there is below 65 centimeters below, there is a dense gravel layer, and that represents maybe a desiccation means dried out. So the, the lake was gone. The fine grained sediment is thickest here, and so on. Um, so then the last sentence is changes in sediment sources and transport vary between lakes and over time with the big size, with the size of alpine glaciers, lake bathymetry, which is the depths, and runoff variability, driving sediment, transport, and storage dynamics on centennial to millennial timescales. And I see that somebody pointed out that the last sentence, Chuka, that the last sentence is, is really the you know, the result of the thesis that they're coming out with. What would you call the part between, uh, in addition, down to sedimentary, sediment delivery? What section is that? I guess it's also partly methods, right? The, the ground penetrating radar, and then approximately 65 centimeters yeah, it's the results, right, with the concrete values. Cool. Okay, very good. And, you know, there's a, like the science community just uses so much jargon. It's just astonishing. I mean, there's all kinds of jargon in here. The next slide, please. So let's do the same again for this one. So are they identifying the different sections for this one as well? Yeah, sorry. <laughs> so yes, you can maybe identify um, the first, you know, the first two sections, like that you would call the, the you know, general background, maybe more specific background and the questions. So please yeah, go ahead and either um, type it or, um, or, or unmic and unmute rather. Michael, were you gonna speak up? Yes, Ruth, uh, the slides actually will give you the link before the day is done. So where would we put the, um, okay, so methods to results, is that is that this? Are you talking, Elizabeth, are you talking about this one or the previous one? No, that was for the previous one. Oh, okay, yes. So where would you say that it goes from being general background to more specific background? So you would say everything up to 2018 is general information. So I think that's more or less true. What do other people think? Yeah, more specific. Actually, it's it sort of moves into the methods here. You know, you've got these groups are meeting. This interdisciplinary group came together, and that's actually sort of me methods. Now, let's see the first two sentences. Um, so the first three lines is sentence one, and then the next two lines is sentence two. So the first one is very general. The second one is a little bit more context. Right, right, Sarah. Um, and then the third one is like focusing, zooming in more on the problem, which is that well, actually, sentence two does too, that it's the rice abundance has been um, declining. And that's that's a problem being mentioned. And then the third sentence, um, stewardship indigenous voices have not been adequately involved in the decision making. So that's another problem, right, being articulated. So in 2018, this group from the university came together with natural resource managers from tribes and intertribal organizations to study Manuman with its socio-environmental context. Um, the collaborative that formed was given the Ojibwe name. This is, I think it's, it's uh, I hope I say it nicely. Um, Kawe Gida Nanagada Wendamin Manuman, or uh, first, 
we must consider Manunin in Ojibwe. Okay, so let's see. So that that sort of ties in a bit with like the purpose, doesn't it? Purpose as well as like how what they're doing. Does that does that do you agree with that or not? That it's that, that uh, let's see, from 2018, the next two sentences articulate um, the, sort of the purpose and, and, the, and then what they're doing, the methods. Um, okay, and let's see. Um, and one of the products or results is if you look at additionally, um, the non-tribal Manuman harvesters and researchers and students on our team, um, we are understanding a wide diversity of perspectives and relationships with Manunan. So that, that's, a, that's definitely a result. And then we will share key questions, challenges, and insights um, going forward kind of thing. Okay, cool. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so um, what we're gonna do is give you a few minutes to just sketch out um, your own abstract and it does just doesn't have to be at all like don't worry about wordsmithing it or making it read well this is just for you you don't have to share it and um the idea is to just kind of get you to think about your own project I'm trying to copy this from the <laughs> chat hold on um to put it in there but you can hopefully you can read you can you read this okay So now it's in the chat as well. So you can, if your camera's on, you can turn off, turn off your camera and you can mute yourself if you like, if you're not already and take um, maybe, no, seven to 10 minutes or something to try and sketch out some information here. And like she said, it's just for you guys. But if any of you wants to send it to us, you know, in private to get some feedback, you're more than welcome to do so as well. And through the can do the private chat, whatever it's called. By the way, you don't have to follow this exactly. This is kind of a recipe or a guideline.
you aren't sure what to put in, a, in some of these lot later categories, you can feel free to leave them blank or you can hypothesize what you might find out, make something up. It's, it's fine, you can just try and sketch it out. Um, sometimes if a project is not going well and then you kind of have to shift your focus onto something else, hopefully that isn't happening, but it does sometimes. Um, like focusing on the methodology, for example. Um, and an abstract will be needed if you plan to attend a conference and present a paper or a poster. So you, you would write an abstract as part of your um, submitting to present. Are there any questions or comments? How is it going? Um, I have a question. Mm -hmm. Um. So I guess I assume, here, I'll, I'll open my video too. Okay. Oh. Um, I assume that in an abstract, it's not like writing the introduction to an essay. It's not like we want to conceal anything to say for the conclusion. Um, is that assumption correct? You know, um... I know that when I read abstracts, and I do it a lot with medical ones because I find them interesting, is that in general, they do provide the outcome and the results. And, and then I think, okay, that's, that's really interesting. I'm going to read this. And when they don't, I know I'm really annoyed. I'm like, oh, come on. <laughs> you want me to read this whole paper so I can find out the answer? Um, however, um, yeah, sorry, I just got distracted. But um, when it's when it's a proposal for a conference, there's I think there's a fair bit of forgiveness for people writing sort of a promissory abstract, like we you know we are doing such and such, and we will be doing such and such. So because it's like right now, like here I'm asking you to write an abstract when you're not finished with your research. So I think it's. Good if you can. If you can't, then you say, you know, it looks like such and such is happening, but we have to do more to figure that out. Does that does that answer your question? Yeah, that that makes sense. Thank you. Yeah, yeah good question, um, Julia. Yeah, you know, no worries at all about not being able to fill out some stuff. And you know, like I said, you can make up stuff if you, if you want. Um, and Sebastian had a great question of how to decide how technical to keep your terminology. For example, what kind of audience should you be writing to? Um, 
Mm-hmm. And I mean, Val, feel free to correct me here, but it fully depends on where are you submitting it to, like whether you're submitting it for a conference or, you know, to give a presentation or a journal or some other place that's requiring an abstract. Um, it fully depends where you're submitting it to. And you kind of need to cater it specifically to that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's exactly right. <clears throat> In general, you know, where abstracts don't go to, it's not like it's going to a high school or the public. In general, it's more, it's a narrower audience, so it can be somewhat technical. Um, personally, I like to see, like when I'm reading an abstract of a talk that's being given where I work, the less jargony it is, the more I'm drawn to it, you know, as a non-specialist. Um, but it's it's pretty much fine to be pretty, pretty jargony here. Um, what is kind of missing from this whole thing, this recipe, in my opinion, is is like why it's sort of like why is this important? Which, as you get deeper into research of your own project and topic, it seems obvious why it's important, or at least that that little particular thing is important. But you know, if you're explaining it to your neighbor, or your grandmother, or somebody, you know, why is this important? You have to sort of step back and say, well, we're trying overall to solve such and such a question. Um, I think, you know, Julie, I'd say it's it's probably slightly more in a journal than a conference, um, but not necessarily a lot more. Okay, so um, can you put up thumbs or something if you, are good or you or or something like if you need more time you can do a thumbs down <laughs> thanks Sebastian um so I don't see I can't see what's happening oh eight nine ups oh there they are okay so let's let's do this let's take um a five minute break four minute break and be back at 145. Um, do you need to get a drink or anything? And then when you're back, just turn on your camera at least briefly so that we know you're back. Okay, so take a few minutes break. Stretch and all that.
Okay. Um, well, before we um, move on um, to the talks, um, <clears throat> do you have any um, observations about the abstract, that writing it, or what you think of it as a as a thing, as a structure, or anything like that? Do you feel like you got a start on your, a decent start on your abstract? You're gonna walk away with at least a rough, a rough draft? Yay. Mm -hmm. okay. <laughs> and let us know what the easiest or the hardest part about writing an abstract is for you, like for you personally, like I know for me, I always struggle with how much of the results I should actually include. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, that's good, Sebastian. <clears throat> and I'm glad Jaden and Ruth and Nick is helping. Yeah, I should probably use this when I'm writing my next abstract. <laughs> this formula. <laughs> Yeah, it does, it needs whittling down, doesn't it? Um, Sebastian, you start and then you make it smaller and smaller. It is really hard to be concise, super hard. It's actually, I don't know if they still do this <clears throat> in courses, but pricey writing where you have to condense some kind of writing is really a good activity to get, skill to get good at. All right, so, would you say this just for future reference? <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> well, I'm just going to assume maybe that it's <laughs> from the answers we got, the few that this this is a worthwhile activity or exercise. Um, <clears throat> yeah, give it a thumbs up or a thumbs down, and we don't see your not your name or anything. But if you think this was worthwhile, okay, let's move on to the next slide, please. Okay, so how to give a good talk and avoid giving a bad one. Um, all right, um, next slide, please. So what are some situations when it might be important that you are able to give a good presentation? And feel free to, to speak or write. Not that it's ever important to give a bad one, but when do you particularly want to give a, a good presentation? Yeah, con conferences, doctoral defense, yeah, job interview, yeah, job interview for sure, or on the job maybe if you're giving one, you know, to your for your work. Yeah, those are definitely oh proposals, yeah, project proposals. Yeah, these are excellent um, class presentations. Yeah, lectures, right? <laughs> so I think after this present, after this workshop today, what you're going to notice, I find, is I go to talks, uh, lectures, or to conferences. I'm like, oh my god, they're doing everything wrong on their slides. <laughs> okay, next slide, please. Okay, so this is probably a familiar scene. You know, you're in the auditorium at the university, and some professors got the slide up with this tiny print and you know it looks like he's just taken a picture out of the lab book or something <laughs> and it's not very engaging and it's like okay he really wants me to pay attention to that highlighted bit and it's just it's tough right it's like no wonder the phone is appealing um okay next slide please so um actually let's skip this one for now and we'll come go back to this so let's skip this um, so one of the things that um, we'll, we'll get to in a minute, but is that research has found about in the 1980s that people can't listen and read at the same time because it uses the same part of the brain. They can listen and look at images, but um, listening and reading together doesn't work very well. Our brains get overloaded. And that's part of why it's no fun when we get... Um, slides that have tons of text on it. The way that people learn the best according to research is by listening and 
um, having images, whether that's maps, photos, graphs, that kind of thing. Of course, if you don't have good, you know, auditory processing skills, it's different. But um, okay, so next slide, please. Okay, so I'd like you to think about tech uh, slides that you um, see in classes um, or talks, and. Um, Sorry, and um, see what what do you what do you what do you think about this, or what what are the problems with this particular slide? If it's a slide, it may have been a poster, but let's presume it's let's just assume it's a slide, or maybe both. And David, we'll come back to your question. So, what do you think of this slide? Too much info to process. Yeah, too too much to understand. Too busy. Real busy. Yeah, busy. Yep. Too many words. Yep. It is the chaotic. Text will like, probably be too small for part of it. Pardon? Um, the text for part of it will probably be too small if, if it was on a projector. Oh right, that's a good point. Too small to read. Yeah. And too many different sections pulling focus away from each other. Exactly. Um, yeah, it's like, where do I look? And, you know, I don't know about you, but I can't read um, what's on the right hand graph. Um, and, the, and the text is pretty tiny. Um, yeah, so next slide, please. And not colorblind friendly, right? It has like orange and green. Okay, so um, this is really the big mistake. So I just want to tell you a story about this fellow. He, gentleman, he died a few years ago, but there's a video of him giving a talk about how to give a good talk. And so I guess this is his area of expertise. <clears throat> and he is sitting in a cafe and uh, somebody comes up to him and recognizes him and says, oh, professor, um, I'm, I'm going to Europe. Um, on Wednesday to present a talk. And I was wondering if you could look at my slides and give me some feedback. And then this fellow, the professor, he says, oh, sure, I'd be happy to. You have too many and there are too many words on them. <laughs> so he hadn't even seen it, but he could say, you have too many slides and you have too many words on the slides. So people, we sort of think that we have to put all the words up here because now we can you know, help us remember what to say, or if people didn't hear me, they can read it, that kind of thing. But it's just not really great for the brain. Um, you could click on, yeah, let's click on another one too, Rose. I think there are a couple of, yeah. Um, so yeah, this is another, I mean, this is a, a what, what's the big problem here with these graphs? Similar to before, but, <clears throat> Yeah, too small to read. Can you read the axes? Only a little bit on that top right one, right? Yeah, illegible and not explained, right. I mean, you could explain it verbally, but um, it's pretty hard to, you'd have to really be clear about explaining the axes and things. Yeah, kind of intense. And we you know sometimes we try to do it because it's like, well, we only want to have 10 slides. And it's like, well, let's cram all this stuff in there. Um, next slide, please. Oh, hold on. So if you go back, see the top right one, which is too tiny. Um, if you go in the next slide, um, it's bigger. And it's a little blurry, but you can actually read the axes. So it's gear along the bottom and heat content along the side, the y-axis. And so this is the global ocean heat content in the top 2000 meters of the ocean, probably combined, figured out through both data and modeling. And you can see that there's been a large rise. This is in joules. So um, I'm not that familiar with how that translates into other things, but anyway, you get the idea. It's, it's gone up a lot in this time, the heat content of the ocean. Next, please. So there's an approach that, um, that we want to introduce to you today that is called the assertion evidence approach. 
And this approach asks for you to build your talks on messages, not topics. And so in this approach, you support those messages with visual evidence, not bulleted lists. Um, this is the website. You can just look up assertion evidence slides. And it's, it's the fellow's name is Michael Alley, who's at Penn, Penn State. And Rose, do you want to switch to that um, Vimeo, um, Vimeo video that we can watch? It's about five, it's a little less than five minutes long. And we can't, I can't hear it. I don't know. Can you not hear it? I couldn't hear it. I don't know about others. The first version oh. evidence approach is to build your talks on messages, not topics. Most engineers and scientists, unfortunately, follow PowerPoint's defaults for the headline and build their talks on topic phrases. Two problems arise from that choice. First, the topic phrase does not focus the speaker on the most important details of the work. Second, members of the audience are not sure what to grab onto should they lose track of the speaker. As an example, for a slide on the effect of using a green roof on an urban building, most presenters would follow PowerPoint's defaults and write a headline such as effect of green roofs. Then those presenters would create a bulleted list of all the messages that they wanted to say about this topic. If room still existed on the slide, those engineers and scientists would add visual evidence. The result would be a cluttered slide with too many words for the audience to comprehend. A better way would be to begin the slide not with a phrase, but with an assertion, namely a succinct sentence that states the takeaway message of the slide. Many presenters who use the assertion evidence approach actually draft those assertions on paper or post-it notes away from the computer. Then, once they have their messages ordered in the way that they want for the talk, they go to the computer to create a slide for each message. Notice that once the speaker knows what the assertion or main takeaway is for each slide, the speaker is more focused in selecting support for that assertion. So another question that you might have is why should we choose green roofs over any other method? Well, as we already discovered, urban heat islands um, make cities have higher temperatures than the surrounding rural areas. And this, these images show a really great representation of that. So take a look at the picture on your left. That's showing Chicago City Hall with the green roof. And then next to it is a building with a conventional rooftop. Now take a look at the picture on your right. This is showing the drastic difference between the temperatures and the surface temperatures of these two surfaces. We can see the conventional rooftop is reaching temperatures of 150 degrees Fahrenheit, whereas the green roof is only reaching temperatures of about 70 to 80 degrees. So this is a big difference. And the green roof not only has a cooler surface temperature, but it also has cooler air around it as well as inside the building. Another benefit to green roofs is actually the cost. And although green roofs have a higher upfront cost, that cost is then offset by the lower energy bills in the future. Studies have shown that on average for a 21,000 square foot roof, you can save about 200,000 US dollars over the lifetime of that green roof. Notice how the speaker folded transitions, secondary assertions, and background details into the spoken words of the talk. Put another way, for the one sentence written, there were seven to 10 sentences spoken. The result was that the audience was not burdened with having to read too much text, and the speaker built credibility and projected confidence from owning so much of the information. Now, after watching that scene, you might be thinking that you understood that scene, but never read the sentence headline. What we would say would be, 
fantastic. The speaker was on her game as a presenter, and you were on your game as the listener. However, at a scientific conference or in a technical meeting, if an audience member becomes distracted or tired, that sentence headline is a safety rope that helps the audience member stay with the speaker. Although the audience member will not understand everything from the scene, she or he will know the main takeaway and then can stay with the talk. Thank you, Rose. <clears throat> and they have several different um, videos with excuse me, examples, um, well, people talking about this method and also using it um, at this assertionevidence.com that you see at the bottom here. <clears throat> so this is, um, so in this, this slide, like I'm modeling what they're doing by saying, make a statement in the heading to convey the take home message of the slide. And then in the example slide, they have fillets Fillets reduce leading edge vortices in nature and in engineering. Fillet on a dorsal fin of a shark, fillet on a sea wolf submarine. And so, <clears throat> excuse me, um, then as a speaker, you can talk about the details of this and what, what it, how it happens. Next slide, please. So here's, um, this, is, this is actually from the um, Penn State uh, group and website. Um, so bullets are not memorable because bullets do not show the connections and they also do not convey anything quickly. So you check out these, it's like accelerometer outputs and analog voltage, and then hardware converts analog signal to digital. And then, you know, it's actually, you don't even know that there's a, a then, but if you go to the next slide, the, it's actually put into a figure. And so these are basically, the, these are the same points, these, these little white texts lines are actually the bullet points from the previous slide. However, with this sort of map of what's happening, you get to see, oh, okay, <clears throat> an accelerometer puts out output, and then the hardware converts it analog to digital, and then the computer samples the number of points, and then it's export exported, the data is exported to pop. So you get a feel for like what's going on. So if you ever have a bulleted list, See if you can turn it into something like this and have a few you know, figures so that you, <clears throat> you can avoid just a plain old bulleted list that kind of puts people to sleep. And uh, what I have heard and read is the text on the slide is really <clears throat> partly for you, the speaker, just to help you remember what to do, but mostly they don't, people don't need it. The audience doesn't need it. Of course, that depends on their hearing ability and everything. Next slide. So this is another slide from that same group. <coughs> so on the left, they had two classes um, being taught at the same time, like same semester, um, geology. And in one of the classes, the professor used the traditional method of, of making a slide, which is on the left. You know, now we're going to talk about iron and all the bullet points about iron on Earth that it accounts for 95% of metals used and <clears throat> so on. And then in the other class, the teacher used the uh, assertion evidence way of making a statement or uh, an observation, but into, into the title, which is iron ores make up 5.6% of the earth's crust and account for 95% of the metals used. Now, I don't know about you, but I didn't really get that from the left slide. And then they're able to show pictures of it with a little bit of descriptors, a map of where you can find it. And then you, you know, the speaker can talk about it. And what they found was, um, so testing people later that, um, as you see there, the left-hand side, there was a 59% recall of this information. And on the right with those slides, it was a 77% recall. And that's at a level of significance 0 0.001. So they're significantly different. Um, I think that's a nice example. Next, please. So here's an example of 
of um, you know a nice um, a, a nice slide where you can put, you know talk a lot about the plate tectonics and um, the layers of the earth and then how does that affect uh, resources maybe along fault lines or subduction zones that kind of thing so next slide please and then you can tie it in to you know following one the best places to harness geothermal energy are at the plate boundaries <clears throat> with a, a nice photo and then an example Iceland is almost entirely run on geothermal energy and so again they're using the title that's you know a message Next slide, please. And then this is one more that they have. Um, so in summary, only a small uh, percentage of water on Earth is readily available. And so this could be a last slide of a talk. Um, in the US, water is mainly used for agriculture and power plant cooling. And so that's also a statement. You know, it's not just like figure one pie chart or <laughs> something like that. It's making the conclusions, helping the audience get the point of what you want to make the point. <clears throat> Next slide, please. So here's here's a comparison of just like um, you know good and good and bad. So this is here we are. It's like okay, this is a typical scientific presentation using PowerPoint's default um, pattern. So it's uh, we we're talking about the MacBook Air here and you know we're really excited to introduce this really thin light notebook computer it's got a 13 inch display backlit keyboard intel processor and it really is cool and exciting and i hope you get you get what i'm saying and then go to the next slide and this is actually what steve jobs did <clears throat> and it's like oh well this looks slick the world's thinnest notebook, MacBook Air. So it doesn't have all that data. It has a photo. It has lots of space, lots of white space. And then there's a, uh, I guess when he was presenting it, if you click again, Rose, it, there's a, a shot of him showing how the MacBook Air could fit into one of these envelopes. So it was very simple and effective. And it's kind of more appealing. You look more like a CEO when you give talk, when you give talks like this. <laughs> um, next slide, please. Okay, so here's um, the, their recipe. They they, they provide with us with templates for the, this idea, like with the message and the <clears throat> supporting images of PowerPoint templates that um, we'll we'll share with you. And here's an example of a concluding slide. So. In summary, this sentence headline states the most important assertion of the presentation. And then there's an image that supports that conclusion. Um, and then a supporting point, and then another supporting point, the logo, and then have it animate come in, but if the questions come in after that. Um, next slide, please. So here's an example that they provide of um, one of these. So in summary, the detector failed because of a short circuit created by the abrasion of wire insulation. And then they you know, have this good figure and uh, a little bit of information there and the logo down on the right. So that the audience comes away with like, okay, this is the main point. Because if you remember some of those cluttery slides, it's like you would not even have any idea what the main point was because it's like your eyeballs go nuts. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so um, now I'd like you to take a minute and, and think about what could be a possible title for your talk if you want to, if you'd like to convey a message rather than simply a topic. So if you were putting together a, one of these sentence topics that conveyed a message, even if you don't know what your results are. Um, you can just make it up and just pretend that it's either significant or not significant or something like that. So go ahead in the chat. And Rose, did you do you want to add anything? Oh, there's a good one. So Ariana, is that your is that your suggestion right now? I love it. What went wrong? 
<laughs> if that's your title. <laughs> Oh, okay, that's a subtitle. Oh, right, for a slide, yeah. Right, or a title for the, a slide, right. How much are the CO2 levels changing in Portland? Mm -hmm. And you might want to add whether you're talking about like near surface air or, or what it is. Um, some people say don't ask questions in the in the title, but I think that it's it can be, I think it lures people in personally. Or if you want to speak up, please do. Okay. Well, let's go to the next slide. Okay. So this, this formula that we used in the abstract is similar to what you use in a talk, basically. It's sort of like the what, like what are we talking about? Why is it important? Remember that part. Why is it important for when you give a talk or you make a poster? How, how are you doing this and what happened? And then what does this imply for the future in terms of society or uh, future research? Um, Ooh, I like that. Sebastian, that's great. So if you can include something from everyday life in the title, like a mirror that can convey an idea really well, it's really excellent. So the ionosphere, a moving mirror. I love that. Um, other examples from the past have been, that were became quite famous were, um, uh, let's see, the flickering light switch. And it was about it was about climate change being really rapid at times in the past. Um, there's a, a good a professor who does uh, good analogies, and he describes a big glacier as a pile of molasses, which just helps you envision that it's like oozing and flowing and that kind of thing. Um, Sebastian, can you just elaborate a little bit about what the moving mirror means? Um, yeah. So my topic mainly focuses on. Uh, like seeing how waves bounce off of the ionosphere and so describing it as a mirror is a really easy way of sort of yeah saying how the waves would move instead of going into the entire like you know oh it's because of doppler shift and the changing you know index right. of refraction it's, it's it's easier to say mirror because we intrinsically know that mirrors reflect that's really cool nice job okay so uh, let's go to the next slide. So here we're going to take some time to um, build a draft for you to build a draft. Maybe you've already started one, that's fine. Um, a slideshow for your talk. Um, and it doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be at all perfect. But what we want is for you to create, say three, four or five slides on your project. And you can use random photos, um, pretend title. You can, if you have a logo, don't spend too much time getting the logo because you can do that later. Um, if, if you have graphs, you can put them in there. Try to keep a lot of space and try out the assertion evidence way of writing about the message and then using um, the images to really convey. And if you want to be super cool, leave a lot of space around it and you can do the legit Steve Jobs thing. So, um, I am going to, what I'm going to do is share with you a folder, a Google folder where you can find um, four different templates for PowerPoint. One of them, two of them are four by three ratio and two of them are 12 by nine. And one of each is um, black or white background. I just need to run that. Hopefully this is the right folder. So, Maybe if somebody could just click on it and let me know <clears throat> if that let you into a folder that has some PowerPoint slides called AE for um, assertion evidence. And then you hopefully can download one of those to use. Um, 
Great. Okay. So uh, Lauren, we'll talk to you in a minute about that. Um, so what I'd like you to do let's see, let's do is to take, say, 25 minutes or so, maybe 30, um, 20, 25 minutes um, to create a few slides of your own slideshow. Um, and you can just use regular PowerPoint if you want. The, these PowerPoints from the assertion evidence templates they have examples like they'll have a slide with an example and then a blank one and then another one with an example so you can delete whatever from there and it's really meant to help with uh, reminding us like how big it should be the text and that kind of thing uh, please let us know if you're having any troubles with that i'm just going to get um, to what else about this And by the end of the, the 25 minutes, <clears throat> um, we're going to have volunteers give us a little talk, like maybe three people, uh, just to get a sense of what you were able to do in a few minutes. Um, Rose, maybe you can go to this website for a minute that's in the chat. All right, I'm on the website. Okay, can you share it? Just a second. Can you guys see it? Yes. So you can see that, excuse me, they have these templates and the ones on the top are the four by three, which is the old style, older style PowerPoint. And then the ones, the two on the bottom are um, 16 by nine ratio. So they're wider. <clears throat> And um, then they have one with the black background, one with the white background for you to pick from. And, and then Rose, if you could move that away <clears throat> and go back to the slides and then go to the next slide. <clears throat> Here is the, oh, I have a frog in my throat. <clears throat> Here's the sort of recipe again, um, same, same thing kind of thing. And to make, for example, if you had four or five slides, can you have uh, one for, you know, some of the first several of these? Are there any questions? Uh, I have a question about titles. Sorry, sorry, I was muted. Yes, go ahead. Um, I was wondering, I guess like since we're making presentations and not um, research papers, I guess I'm having trouble writing like I guess more of a snappy title that other people seem to be doing. I was mm -hmm. just writing like, um, here, I'll just put mine in the, <laughs> I'll put mine in the chat. Um, and it, it's just like a, literally like what oh, yeah, the, okay. the project is about. But I'm wondering if like that's- Oh, okay if that works or if for a presentation, if it's better to be a bit more snappy? Um, well, I think I think first I would maybe try to make sure it's just a, a bit more clear. Um, so, so you're using drones 
um, mm -hmm. to model the flood stages of the LA River mm -hmm. with greater accuracy. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, even saying like <clears throat> using drones, because <laughs> drones are so popular, um, using drones to um, improve accuracy and uh, modeling flood stages of the LA River. Mm -hmm. And I think that given that you've grown in your title, it's especially if you put it at the front of your title at the beginning, it'll be um, it'll be catchy. I think I I hear you. I'm not particularly good at coming up with super catchy. I mean, <clears throat> maybe was it Sebastian? Maybe Sebastian can help, <clears throat> like flying over the <laughs> flood. <laughs> I don't know. I'll workshop it, but thank you. Okay. Ethan, what about you? What is your um, current title? Oh. I mean, it's pretty good. The only thing that would be nice to remove would be the Latin name, you know, just because it's like it makes it more. <laughs> Um, a little bit jargony, but it's not, as, I mean, you probably want to keep it there. But I think that the predator prey piece is very interesting. I might personally move that to be the, the first topic, predator prey interactions and dietary analysis. Because predator prey interactions is just, you know, innately more interesting than dietary analysis on the surface of it. But I think it's it's fine. We could potentially take out the two commas. Anybody else feel free? Sure, you're welcome. Feel free to put your title in. I have the worst title for my PhD, worst title ever. I think there was also someone else had said, um, like, uh, in their project, they're probably having a lot of technical issues. I'm also having a lot of technical issues, and they they were wondering if that's worth putting into uh, mm -hmm. the method uh, results. Mm -hmm. um, so what do you think? I I think so. I mean. This is just my take on it. Um, if if you have interesting results, like scientific results, from in spite of the technical struggles with equipment, then you know for sure highlight that, highlight those results, and then kind of have it be you know this piece was overcoming those challenges, and that's interesting. Like that's part of the story. It's like oh, this was really hard to do. It wasn't just like doing this and that. Um, if, if, on the other hand, that you're not getting data or results because of the struggles with the instrumentation, that kind of thing, um, what people sometimes do will be to shift their entire focus to the, the methodology. And, you know, you could change your title to be like issues with the method of, you know, using ground penetrating radar <clears throat> underwater. That makes a lot of sense. So, so Chris, would you, I guess in this case, um, <laughs> I mean, you could say the challenges, for instance, the challenges of using drone imagery to model fl flood stage modeling or to model flood stages of a river. Mm -hmm. if, if you feel like you, if you, in the end, if, if you and your mentor kind of conclude, oh, well, you know, we weren't really able to do this, but we can certainly help people understand what the challenges are. Mm -hmm. I think for my project, it certainly is feasible, but I think that we have just been having issues with 
precision and it's I'm, sh I'm sure that we could figure out the issue it's just that we don't have enough time to uh -huh. really get down to it and work out the kinks right and so therefore it feels sort of like our project may be incomplete at the end of this are you um and so i it feels a little bit um dissatisfactory to end on the conclusion of being like i if only we had more time to work out the kinks you know mm -hmm. yeah and i think that's <clears throat> I think that's honestly partly the culture in science. It's like people don't report negative results or results that don't show something. Um, and it's all about, you know, well, we found this conclusion and made this discovery. Um, when in fact, sometimes the other, the other things like the problems end up leading to great discoveries and they are more interesting. So it's, it's definitely a cultural thing. Like, you know, oh, I really wish I had some results. And um, yeah, it's such a short period of time. I mean, you, you're all doing basically, it's like a mini master's thesis <laughs> in 10 weeks or so. And so it doesn't allow for those kinds of issues. Um, I guess, I think when you're, when you're looking at your title to just make sure that it's accurate, like if you're not actually dealing with improving the accuracy of the models with drones then i wouldn't say that i would say more like you know using drones and and leave out accuracy because you know if, if you're not quite getting the results does that make sense i don't know if it, if it aligns with what you're doing mm -hmm. that that makes sense okay thank you sure <laughs> This is more fun doing it in person, but unfortunately we are all scattered all over the place. <laughs> I don't know, Val, did you already mention um, like the length the title should be? I did not. I'm looking at Ethan's title and it looks a little bit long to me. Is there any way, like, is there a yay or nay for how long a title should be where it's like it's frowned upon or it's fine if it's longer? Well, I think if you're right, I think it's if it can be shortened, then that's good. Like, for example, um, maybe Ethan, you could stick um, summer, the word summer in between <clears throat> let's see so let's say predator prey summer interactions or something like that um just to take it out the during the summer out of 2023 um or you could put like interactions of this summer of 2023 california moray just a little bit shorter but I think it's fine, really, in terms of length, especially if you spread it out, like, horizontally.
How's it going? Is, does anybody need help with anything? It's, it's, yeah, it's unfortunate we're not um, able to jump over and see what you're doing. But. If I could, I would send out chocolate-covered espresso beans to anybody who wanted them. <laughs> I'm going to share the title of one of one of the people in the room um, sent it to me, which is a nice one. Canopy transpiration of mocker nut hickory, red oak, and white oak in temperate forests of New Jersey and their response to environmental parameter light. So what we're hoping is that you'll walk away today with at least a start on, on, your, ta on your talk, kind of a rough, rough draft. I am curious about how, if you, if you like the template or did you go back to just plain old PowerPoint? Oh, thanks, Ariana. Let's see. Temporal degradation of H. Lenny detection of PCR following storage in 70% ethical. Ethical? Is it ethical? Long storage in ethanol. Got it. Huh. Is PCR the method? I think it's used in COVID detection, right? Maybe you might consider moving, um, Ariana, moving, having it be like temporal degradation of H. Lenny. Um, so detected by PCR or by DT PCR detection, or maybe move that to the very end and have following storage in 70% ethanol. And may maybe, yeah.
using using PCR detection yes, at the end. Thank you everybody for hanging in. And we really hope this will all be helpful. Right, that's interesting. We can, yes, revealing that laying out your thoughts that you have on paper is very different. I thought it was interesting the point that the, the Michael Alley made about putting your messages on sticky notes. It's not, you know, when you're used to using PowerPoint, it's not what you naturally go to. Paper, you know, whiteboards are great. If, if you were, you know, if you can have a big piece of paper to explain to your roommate or somebody what you're doing or to your mentor and you can it shows you how it's like oh you have to really go back to basics here Wow, that's um I think that's a good title, Sarah. What do you think, Rose, if you're there? It sounds complex to me. It does, but it sounds good. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't even think it's that bad to be a little big sometimes I know some people get like super specific in their titles and it's like that sounds a lot more complicated than it needs to be <laughs> sometimes keeping it broad isn't that like keeping it broader especially if you're covering various topics isn't that bad mm -hmm. I, th I think it's possible that you could reorganize <clears throat> some of the words um, to get the relationship of the two things up the front of the sentence. Um, something like subsurface marine, um, heat wave characteristics and mechanisms of formation, or something like that. Does that make sense, Sarah? Cool. Just two more minutes and then maybe in five minutes we'll um, see who wants to volunteer to give us their talks. Even if it's just two slides, that's fine. Or even one slide. Yeah, I, I, Julia, I hear you. I, I actually haven't um, sort of sat down and really tried to use their templates, but I can see what you're saying. Like it's hard to come up, come up with, and even for each slide, like you know, a, na a narrow, narrow it down. Um, let's see, linking early Cretaceous ocean basin records in the Southern Patagonian Andes. I mean, to me, that makes sense. Um, I mean, I, I have a background in geology, so I understand, you know, what it means. But um, can you, can you, um, Mike, maybe, and tell us a little bit about what the goals are 
or implications might be. Or if you don't want to unmic, if you want to write it, that's fine. Okay. And if anybody wants to put their name down to volunteer to give us their short talk, uh, we'd love to sign you up. Val, how much longer do you want to give them? Just a, so they, oh, a good point. Two, maybe two more minutes. Two, quarter two. Good job working on this. You know, it takes a lot of concentration. Oh, that's interesting, Julia. I think it would be worth, <clears throat> even if you don't have answers, but if you can say, you know, um, maybe phrase it like a question even. <clears throat> it's a kind of, I guess, you know, considering that it's so interesting what you've got up here for this, I think the title is a little bit um, it doesn't reflect how exciting this is or could be sort of a little bit bland, like, oh, just linking this and that, you know. Um, like for instance, this would be probably going maybe further than you want, but uh, tectonic, global tectonic changes versus lo uh, local water, local changes as reflected by um, the linked um, geochronology of two sites in the, in the Andes. Okay. Yeah, I got it, Julie. <clears throat> okay. Can we get three people to, to volunteer to give us many presentations? Out of all these people, there's got to be a few who are willing to do this, feeling comfortable and confident. Again, it can be one slide, two slides, four slides. Ethan, would you consider doing it? Be one of them? I was just typing. Um, <laughs> um, I'm a bit apprehensive. I am trying to work through it right now. But I think one of my big issues is like sourcing out interesting, like, I don't know. It's just, 
I think I'm I'm way too picky right now for, oh, for yeah. making like for making any sort of slide. I don't that's not a very good excuse, but like oh, with with cool. more research and stuff, I'm like I'm really running into problems of like finding pertinent visuals and making anything that looks more than like a I don't know, like a Dora the Explorer slideshow or something is just it's pretty rough at this point. Fine, I'm trying to work there, but I've I've been like working on doing my little speed talks in the past few oh, days. So okay. I mean, if we really need to spill space, I can try to do that. <laughs> <laughs> the elevator pitches. <clears throat> You're right. I mean, I think that would be terrific, actually. So let's see if we could, if you are up for it. Um, you you know, I I can relate about the slides. It's like I get carried away with details, and you know, kind of I realize, oh, later on, I might even throw out the slide I spent all that time on. Um, Ruth, yay. Hey. Ruth, can I share mine? You're more than welcome to. Oh, thank you. Uh, do I need to screen share? Yes, please. Okay. And if somebody else is interested, please just message us. Thank you for doing this, Ruth. Yeah, no worries. I mean, it's a little thrown together, but um, I had a a photo of the diagram um, that I drew, so I could use that. Oh, cool! Ooh, you see? Thanks. Yeah, and if you can go into slideshow, yeah. you didn't do all oh. this today, did you? All of those slides? Oh, I did just now. Wow, that's amazing. Oh, thank you. The chills. That's amazing. Look at that. Seven slides. Okay. Yeah. Go into. Oh, oh, not not all of them. These are some of them are the default. I just have five slides. Oh, okay. Five is still amazing. Yeah. <laughs> really. Okay. Uh, Can you put it into the slideshow mode? Yeah. Um. How do you do that? See over over to the right on the top. It says slideshow. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Oops. Okay. Um. So. Um. I just started only the third week of my RU, but um, what I'm going to be doing is measuring the CO2 levels in downtown Portland mm -hmm. um, with my mentor, Dr. Rice, and also with the help of a couple of the people that work in the lab. Cool. Um, so mm -hmm. CO2 levels, they're always changing. Um, so even though they have been recorded in downtown Portland before, um we still need to record them continuously and that seems to be what dr rice's lab specializes in and there's a line to draw in air from the roof to monitor it um i'm using a monitor it's called a lycor system because the main machine is from the company lycor but there's a diagram of um, everything else that's on it wow, that's that awesome. i drew thank you it's sort of so mm -hmm. it's Frankenstein together sure. from from multiple parts. It's awesome. And um, it's, it's just showing that the Lycor machine it measures both H two O content and CO two content. So it's called a Ly Lycor. Is that right? Mm -hmm. So it's called a, the company is Lycor, and the machine is the Ly. 840. Oh, got it. Okay. And um, this is as far as I got, but mm -hmm. first we need to dry the air. Um, so we're also working on um, making an, an air, basically an expensive dehumidifier to dry the air from the roof. And then we can attach it to the system. So can you walk us through that diagram? Um, this is actually not, it's not the one we're using. I just pulled a stock image, oh, okay. but it, it's similar concept. I just wanted to have a visual. Yeah. No, um, it's, it's actually a great a graph. I was just trying to, I guess yeah. if you're dehumidifying, you're getting, you're pulling the water out. So it's, mm -hmm. that's, the, that's the last thing is on the right, bottom right, um, the trap. Oh yeah. It's, I believe it's sort of similar to the one we have. Um, and there's like two of these chambers with the yeah. drying balls in them, and then a suction line 
to the roof. Um, and then there's like sort of a, a glass flask that the two goes into. So it's it's sort of like this one. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Can you go back through the slides just so we can see them again? Yeah, should be. Um, this is, I believe it's the same one, that, the same exact one that we're using. Nice, um, nice layout of the slide, by the way. Thank you. And um, this is the actual, yeah. this is what I we hope, actually have. I hope you keep the other main component talk. is the data logger. Okay. Yeah, keep this in your talk. It's refreshing. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, um, yeah. And then All right. this is just a, a Getty image. Of. And so the, I guess the one thing that I haven't heard you talk about is mm -hmm. why, why this is important to do. So if you can, in the first or second slide, maybe the first slide, um, mm -hmm. the title slide is to include that why, like, why are you measuring CO2 levels in downtown Portland? Like, is, yeah. Okay, that's good feedback. What are I you have trying? some. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. What are you trying to figure out? Do we have another volunteer? Oh, wait, before we move on, does anybody oh. have any um, comments for Ruth? Like. Starting with the positive, please. We're constructing that in 25 minutes. I'm blown out of the water. Good job. <laughs> it's oh, it's, you sort of cut out a little bit. I can hear you. I'm sorry. Oh, um, I basically just said you blew me out of the water. That was amazing that you constructed oh, that you. in like roughly 25 minutes. That's wild. Thank you. I, I do a lot of editing in my spare time yeah. just for fun. Good for you. I mean, I think I'd be stuck on the slide, first slide still. Yeah. And Ariana says, awesome presentation. And Crystal says, seconding. Thank Great you, guys. Work. I appreciate Great that. Work. Yeah, it's really terrific. And that you can walk home, go home today, or well, maybe you're already home, and just um, you have you have a beginning of your slides uh, for your talk, which is awesome. Okay. Can we have at least one more person present their slides? And it, as I say, it can be one or two slides or three slides. Ethan, do you want to, do you want to, I mean, this is, this takes a lot of courage and you don't have to do this. In addition, I was going to ask you to do your elevator pitch, but if you could show us even your slide that you're stuck on, like that can be helpful to see. Yeah. Sure. You're like, oh, um, I'm stuck because I'm doing too much detail on this bit here, or I can't find the image that I want or something. Yeah, let me see if I can okay, I'll share my screen. You know, let me pull up. Because I'm doing this on my phone. So let me make sure that this oh is my like gosh. all gonna work out. Well, yeah. I have the I have it up on my computer. Like the, the work I'm doing is on oh, my computer, good. but the okay. Zoom call is on my phone. Oh, got it. Okay. So, so let me see if I can share. I can find the slideshow on my phone sheets you, you here can, and then share you it. Can upload a file in the chat is another way. Michael Salinas, any chance you would want to show us a slide or two? Or Sebastian? Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not really too, uh, okay. I, I try to, I, they're kind of wordy. I didn't really, uh, have a lot of pictures, so oh, it's yeah, kind of, yeah, I couldn't really follow the, the, the format. So yeah, it's, yeah. <laughs> okay. So something you can work on later, getting images to represent things, for example, Sebastian. Huh? Any chance you'd want to share a slide or two? And um, Ethan, if you have it figured out, please go ahead. Oh, I absolutely don't have it completely figured out, but I will share my video right now. Oh, yeah. And okay. um, I'll just point it at my screen here. Yeah, I recognize you from another workshop. <laughs> 
<laughs> here we go. This is, I mean, I've just been working on this graphic here. Um, oh, I've been know. adapting it from okay. another. I'm sorry, I was just going to say to people, if you go to the upper right corner and you change from gallery to speaker, you get a zoom in on, on the image. Ah, okay. Yeah, so, I mean, this is just the graphic that I've been working on, but essentially my, um, my work I'm going to be doing over the summer is on, I'm going to be doing a dietary census of the California moray eels in the summer of 2023 on Catalina Island. Um, That's a great studying diet. predator prey, yeah, studying predator prey interactions for specifically moray eels is proving to be, they're proving to be an excellent model organism for tertiary predators. And um, our goal throughout the summer is to essentially have a better understanding of how their diets are changing over the 13 year um, study that we've been conducting. Mm -hmm. uh, wow. Our methods are in line with um, what previous groups have done in the past. So essentially we're going out, we're deploying wire traps at different coves around the Two Harbors Bay on Santa Catalina Island. Mm -hmm. And we're leaving them in for 12 hours of soak time, pulling them out and aggregating morph morphological feature data and dietary data in order to, geez, yeah, no, this is where I start to break down a little bit, but um, here, let me try to work through it in my brain. I'm getting like, I'm, I'm just still like, this is like my first REU. I'm a, it's like the first time I'm learning great. to do all this. Oh, stuff, this but. is great. It's terrific. And yeah. the diagram is really, it's, it's, and you can talk about the diagram in your talk. And, and when you're talking about um, going around to the harbors or the bays and, and dropping things in and show photos, you know, you can show photos because everybody likes to see water pictures and, um, mm -hmm. And I mean, I, I understand what you're you're saying as you you're trying to wrap your head around like what does the aggregated data tell you or you know and why is this important that kind of thing. But um, I, what I, one thing I like is actually that you stay. Yeah, I think. I... Sorry. Go ahead. Oh no, no, you keep going. Oh, I was gonna say I like I actually like that you were staying on one slide um, because then I could listen and I wasn't again I wasn't trying to read or anything. Oh yeah, no, I, I just haven't worked on any other slides as well, but <laughs> um, this is, yeah, I mean, I think that's, that's this cool. is about as like, yeah, I mean, removing some stuff down here because this was just what I was working on. I mean, I think this was actually me putting in notes from the other day as well, but I mean, just even like a, a slide of something along the lines of, of this and making it extra pretty, but to to help me have something visual just to cue me into like, yeah. Um, I don't know. I think I'm struggling with putting into practice what the speaker was sort of talking about that we, or the, the video that we watched today, where it was mm -hmm. having more of like uh, conclusions and like oh, yeah, the, the general messenger. ideas to like, exactly. Yeah. At, at the mm -hmm. top. Cause I mean, that's what I struggle with the most. I have I have ADHD, so like my brain is all over the place and drawing the conclusions between what I'm doing in research is like by far the hardest thing oh, for me, okay. but. Yeah, um, and, and yeah. You know, it can be, it can be just sort of descriptive, like, you know, this is what we, this is, this is how we did it. You know, it doesn't have to be like solutions or you know, yeah. fancy, fancy results. I've well, sort of I super lost my track with where I was, but I mean, that's essentially how I would start um sort of explaining and then the the why is like why is this important or valuable i know it, it can be it can be hard because it's fascinating but yeah it's hard I tried to, to hit that why. in the beginning with like talking about how like they're an excellent model for studying tertiary oh, yeah. predator prey interactions but that's really jargony i think and i think explaining yeah, yeah. i think one of like the goals of these talks is to sort of convince people that what you're doing has has like implications and whatnot. And I think for it's hard for me to 
articulate why having like a deeper ecological interaction understanding is important but to me it's really important and it's like I don't know I need to work through how to like articulate that yeah well I, I mean and I like I think that saying this is a good model is is a great idea and then you know if you want to just ex extrapolate or expand it to you know it's like this helps us understand the ecological relationships of the the marine life and which is That's something amazing. like that you know I love that <laughs> yeah, you should be you should be writing my paper for me wonderful <laughs> that's still pretty difficult but anyways well, thank you for sharing and yes brina it is a struggle my family has lots of ADHD. Um, yeah adhd gang wonderful yeah yeah <laughs> yeah so a metaphor that's a good idea yeah like some, you know it's like when you're building a cake or something or you know something not that but no, I, I love that. I love that. Yeah. If we can think of anything, we can. Ruth, you can email me and I can email Ethan. <laughs> well, thanks, everybody. I'm, I want to acknowledge or honor the time. And just to let's just go out of sharing and go into gallery view. And if you don't mind turning on your video, just to say hi and wave, that would be lovely. Um, it's so nice to meet you and um, see you. Hi. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Anyone has any uh, ideas for how to turn on my camera? I tried um, the suggestion in the chat, but it's not working still. Oh, okay. That's really might be a, a technical issue. I might have to deal with it after. Okay. Now, for those of you who are on camera, can you smile while I do a screenshot? Oh, get some more. <laughs> Thank you. I'll do one more because somebody was fixing their hair. <laughs> <laughs> oh, never mind. I'm forgetting. I don't know what I'm doing. Okay, I did get one though. Thank you. And so nice to see you. Wish we were in person. Um, and and thanks for hanging in there and sticking it out. I hope that you walk away with at least, you know, a slide or two that you're happy with that helps you kind of get launched because when you don't know how to do it it sort of feels like this huge wall that you have to climb like how am I going to create a talk but, but now you now you have a better idea and um, I'll send you the some of those links to those videos so you can check those out um, as well oh, now here I am okay I'm going to do another screenshot in case anybody wants to pop on again um yeah, I do thanks. have a question, if you don't mind. Sure. Uh, will these lecture slides be available somewhere? I don't know if somebody already asked. They they are actually they're in that folder. Um, let me just where you got the templates. There's a PDF. Uh, there's a PDF in there. Um, was that in the chat? I think the chat has yeah. exploded. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it has, hasn't it? Um, yeah. Let me just get it from. Some before I have it here. Thank you so much. Oh, sure. Yeah, and if you have any suggestions, um, you know, how to do this, how to improve it, or what you'd like, you know, more resources, let us know. But thanks for joining. We're super psyched to have you here. And um, hopefully, we'll see you next week. We have a career panel for careers outside of academia. Um, it should be good, and uh, we'll look forward to seeing you. Thank you. You're welcome. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Oh, Have you're a rest your days. Thank you for sharing your stuff. <laughs>
we had about 50 people for a lot of it, which are wait, 58, and then it would drop down. And I don't know if you were noticing it, it dropped down, dropped down. Yeah. It's like 48, 45 by the end, I think, which is, or 40, which is half of the original amount, but the majority, like 70 ish, 68 people hung in there for like an hour, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. It seems like an hour sort of where people tend to kind of like, yeah, get a little zoom fatigue. Yeah. And especially if, you know, for those of you on the East coast, it's like that hour, it's a sleep, the nap hour. Yeah. It's about, it's been so hot here. So it's just like, all I want to do is nap in the afternoon. (laughs) So, well, like today, like, the real feel was 48 degrees Celsius. And I was just like, <gasps> not normal. God, that's insane. <laughs> so I'm just yeah. like, I just want to like either go lay in the pool or like, yeah, I'm just go like lay under the AC unit and pray yeah. that it doesn't freeze up and like <laughs> some ice falls on my head. <laughs> right. Because right. it's working over time. <laughs> yeah, we had, I think the highest we had was 85. Oh, was it 85? Okay. I yeah, it was 85, 85 and it stayed around 85. Like it, it stayed between like 80 and 85 for like the first hour. Oh, good. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Which is fine. I think we lost like some people when we gave them the 20 minutes to do exercises. I think that's where we lost some of them to, to yeah. do the slides. So. I mean, I would do probably do the same thing. I'd be like, yeah, <laughs> I'm gone. I'm whereas if you're in person. You can't really right. do that, you know. You sit there, and everybody else is sitting there, right? And you kind of work through it, and you also have like the ability to hop around and help people with their slides, and yeah, I know, I agree. <sighs> so, you want to edit some video? <laughs> <laughs> Am I editing this one? <laughs> yes, please. <laughs>